Hello, this is Richard Tether for the Free Market Roadshow. Sadly, I can't be with you in person this year. And that is really the subject of this talk. Have we damaged the educational prospects, the life prospects of a generation of young people because of the government's heavy-handed restricted lockdowns over the last year? We've seen schools closed, colleges and universities closed, and yes, people have tried to do online lessons, I've tried to do online lessons, and to some extent they've worked, to some extent we've been able to keep things going. But what we've lost is a lot of the richness of education. It's been a very thinned out educational experience. Yes, you can learn things just by having a lot of books, just by being sent things to read, just by being having work marked for you. But you lose a lot of the interaction, you lose a lot of the feedback, and it's a lot more difficult. I know that. You know, I spend all my time giving lectures, but the thought of sitting down for an hour's Zoom meeting or an hour's Teams lecture or whatever is soul-destroying. It's been very difficult. It's been a lot more difficult to concentrate, a lot more difficult to focus, and a lot more difficult to give feedback. I'm sat here recording this lecture for you, and whereas normally I'd have 50 or 100 people opposite me, I'd be getting feedback constantly, I'd be seeing whether people are understanding me, whether they're following what I'm saying. If I had to explain something again, I'd know because I'd see those blank looks that lost expression on people's faces. But with online, with virtual education, I don't see any of that. From an educator's, from a lecturer's point of view, it's very difficult. And it's even more difficult from a student's point of view. And not only the interaction with the teachers, with the professors, it's also the interaction with each other. A lot of education is about young people getting together, talking, having ideas, discussing ideas, learning about the world, learning about other people, as even more so than just learning about your subject. And a lot of that has been lost over this year. And the government really have done very little to try to do that. They've decided that online education is a suitable substitute. And the main problem is that they've been focused so much on trying to preserve lives, what in economics we call the first order effects. So people are dying of the virus, we need to stop that, therefore we need to do everything that we can in order to stop that, and schools and universities and so on have to all close and everybody has to stay at home. But that's missing those second order effects, what we call it, the knock-on effects, the subsidiary effects, the fact that you know people are losing out on all these educational opportunities, on these social opportunities, and not just the hard education, but those soft, the, those uh, social educational matters as well. And there's a whole group of people who are going to leave, having had their education, yes, f formally completed, they'll get the paperwork at the end, they'll get the certificates and so on, but a lot of that richness of the education has been taken away. And especially when as I said in one of my other talks, we're seeing economic contraction as well. Jobs are being more hard to find. So when people are coming out with a restricted education and a limited job market, it's going to be very difficult. And it's not just the online education. It's not just the loss of face-to-face -face discussions, the loss of all that social interaction, educational interaction as well. It's also the attitude that the government has had over the last year to questioning, to debate. We've seen very much an attitude that the scientists have spoken, we have made our decision, this is the way we are going to tackle this crisis. And any dissenting voices have very much been shut down, partly by the governments, through, um, through restrictions, through legislation, through banning protests, but also by the media in restricting dissenting views and particularly social media and online through uh, search engines and so on, through restricting and banning people who are seen to be having different views to the majority. And yes, there are different ways of seeing things. Amongst the scientists, among virus experts, epidemiologists, even amongst them there are different attitudes. 
different beliefs as to the best way of doing this. There have been a lot of debates about whether masks are actually beneficial or not. Do they provide any great benefit? Do they perhaps even provide more harm than good by giving people a false sense of security? Um, do lockdowns, do curfews provide very much benefit or any? Do they cause more harm than good by you know, the mental health issues and other problems that they cause, the isolation, the loneliness and so on? All of these issues, there are different viewpoints, different attitudes, different beliefs that people have. But a lot of that debate has been restricted. And there's an educational aspect of that too, because what are we saying to people? What are we saying to people at school, at university, who are learning? We've been saying for years that you ought to be questioning, that you ought to be debating, that you ought to be challenging these views. And now suddenly, when there is a big public issue and a big public debate and big differences of opinion, the government and the media are saying, no, you mustn't debate this. We shouldn't have dissenting views. We must all follow the same attitude. We can't allow divergent thought. And the educational impact of that is dreadful because we're shutting down debate. We're shutting down the whole idea of the academy, of questioning, of even of science. The government keeps saying we should follow science, but actually what they're doing is following a few scientists. The whole scientific approach, the whole Enlightenment, European Enlightenment approach has been that we should test things, that we should challenge and question, and that it's by testing and debating and bringing in dissenting views that we actually reach the best decisions. That's all gone out of the window because the government are insisting on this very narrow attitude and that we should follow everything without bringing in doubt. Yes, you can see why they're doing it, because they want to increase the compliance with the restrictions. But in the long term, what are we doing to people's education, to the whole idea of European liberty there? We're, we're saying effectively that the government should make decisions and everybody else should obey. And that's a really bad idea in terms of the future for our whole continent. Europe has always thrived on differences. We've done well in the past, we've grown, we've experimented because we've had different opinions, we've had lots of small countries, we've had lots of religious views, social views, economic views, and we've been able to experiment and try different things rather than the, some of the bigger monolithic Eastern countries. And so, and Europe's always done very well in that. But what we're seeing now is a restriction in debate, a restriction in dissent, and a closing down of education. A loss of opportunity because we're only being educated online. We're losing that opportunity to discuss, to debate, to bounce ideas off each other. And just at a time when government's also restricting people and restricting debate, the education of that and the loss of that European Enlightenment, European debate, European liberalism is going to cause huge problems over the next few years. We need to work at that. Events like the Free Market Roadshow are trying to bring in different voices, trying to spread debate. Yes, we're restricted in what we can do this year because we can't meet, we can't discuss in the same way. Hopefully next year we'll be back and we'll be able to actually get together and talk about these things and discuss these things and advance the cause of liberty, the cause of education and the cause of, well, European enlightenment.